Welcome everyone, welcome to oh, Review Yourself. Oh, it's going to be a cracker this one. I'm literally, my, my guest, I'm just waiting to just wind him up and let him go. We have the uh, the fantastic Paul from History Rage. I know I've done a lot of Titanic stuff on this podcast, so you think, oh really, Sean, again? Like, we know you like it. Yeah, but we're going to go through myths, so we're going to dip into some of the, you know, James Cameron's, obviously. But we're also going to dip back to some other Titanic films, that some you might have heard of, some you might not have heard of. I'll try, Paul, not to mention the 2012 series that I've already done a full podcast series on. And, oh, yeah, we won't get into that yet. So, yeah, I'd like to welcome my guest. Welcome, Paul. Thanks for coming on, mate. You are welcome. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So, yeah, big question. Where do we start? Dealer's choice. Go on, you, you, you start off. I mean, to be fair, for anyone, Cameron's Titanic is probably the, the base plate to start on, and then you, we can... Maybe get yeah. the viewers listening. <laughs> yeah, I would quite probably agree. I mean, uh, Cameron's Titanic, I, to start off with, like, I'm going to get angry. You know, Cameron's Titanic. Go for it. I want to start a little bit in defence, first of all, of it, mm-hmm. just on the basis that, you know, as, as a piece of cinematography and an exercise in set design and special effects and possibly even to some extent pacing, it is an absolute masterclass. You know, you want to see how it won all its Oscars. Just go ahead and watch it. And, you know, it's one of the most perfect recreations of the Titanic that we've ever seen on screen. You can see that they've really gone to town on the detail of all the furniture and everything like that. And you can see in a lot of things that are said where they've really paid some attention to details of things that they've got in inquests and for various sources and so forth. And then I start to think... Well, why the hell did you do the rest of the film? I mean, I went to see that in the cinema, and I have to say I was praying for it to end uh, at that point. I thought, yeah, it's like, okay, it's gone under. Fine, can I leave now? No, we have to do this boring bollocks with a 101-year-old woman throwing a diamond into the ocean, which I will come to later on as to just, you know, when we start to talk about who is really the villain of the Titanic film. But it goes... For all the effort that it's put into all the accuracy of its positioning and everything like that, it's gone to some extreme effort to feed a shit ton of myths that have been with us since at least 1912 itself. And we just can't freaking shift them. And the longer this goes on, the more films just add to it. You mentioned the 2012 miniseries. Don't get me started, mate. I just not enough. get started, but that did that did an absolute <laughs> classic. No, no, yeah. You know, and you think you think that okay, so we're written by Julian Fellows, gave us Downton Abbey, gave us Gosford Park, given us that stuff. This is gonna be critical. What the hell was that? Yeah. You know, and how you extend it bear in mind I was waiting for a three hour film, or so to be fair, a two hour forty eight minute film, because less credits Cameron's film takes the same amount of time as Titanic does to sink. I would rather have been on the sinking Titanic than watching that at the time. But I will, an area of that I can defend it, as I say, it's, it's great in terms of set pieces and things like that. And a lot of people expect me, given what my podcast is about, to start just raging about the historical inaccuracies in it. And I think Cameron framed that movie very well in the way that he pitches that, because what you're not watching on the screen there is an account of the titanic disaster what you are watching is the memories of a 100 year old woman who at the start of the film they acknowledge she's got memory difficulties because she can't even remember meeting bill paxton on the deck and she was once a traumatized 17 year old girl in a shitty edwardian marriage who goes through one of the biggest disasters, and I believe it's still one of the biggest maritime disasters that's ever occurred. Peacetime, definitely. Yeah, there are are bigger ones, and I'll reference one or two of those a little later on. But she's this absolutely traumatised 17-year-old girl. So I'm not expecting an accurate account of the Titanic disaster. I'm expecting the barely remembered, mostly made up, bewildered ramblings of an incredibly wealthy woman who's trying to remember back what it was like 80 years ago. So in terms of his accuracy, that wasn't bothering me. 
I'll start on what bothers me, shall I? Yes, please do. So, yeah, it's... We have these classic tropes that, that, that go through all of Titanic's sort of representations of on screen, and it just keeps adding and adding and over-embellishing them. And so, so I'm going to start, first of all, with a classic... That, that I've actually done an episode on this, and this is the this is the idea of your steerage passengers, how they're portrayed, the fact that they're locked below to drown on the basis of class, and the fact that then people are using like revolvers at the back end of pickaxe handles to just batter them through the gates. It's just bollocks. There is absolutely no evidence that. A, that had ever happened, and B, there is absolutely no reason for it to happen. Certainly, once once Smith gives the idea, and I'm not a fan of Captain Smith, you know, I think he's, I'll I'll come to evil Captain Smith in a little bit of time, but this idea that when the call is given to abandon ship, that white steel stewards, the third class stewards, who are of the same class level and type of people, as the people that are in there are going to go, oh, no, you're just the lower classes. You can sit there and drown. The world could do without you. It's fucking ridiculous. Well, they're going to drown as well, aren't they? Like this, if that situation was real, you're being, basically being told, right, you need to keep them down there. and But you're going to have to stand beside the gates while we get the women's and, and the dresses and, and the first class steer, the first class passengers into the boats. Like, like, I don't care how much you love your job. Even in 1912, you, you aren't going to stand there and let yourself drown. No. Your job. It's just not going to happen on top of that. Yeah, you know, at the worst part, you may run away and leave them to their fate. But no, that's not what it's about. In fact, I would argue, third class, I don't call them steerage because on Titanic, they're not. Third class, the White Star's entire business model is built on third class. That is, that is, there are more third class passengers on there than any other class that they've got going. They make more money on Titanic from third class than they do from second class. So if there's a, from at least a commercial point of view, at least, if there is any class that you want to bin off from the Titanic, what you do is you shut second class in their cabins and leave them to go down. And you're going to be, you, you're going to hit a lot fewer of your business returns in doing that. That said, though, it's going to be very hard to shut, to shut second class away because second class have actually got the easiest access to the lifeboats. Literally walk out of the cabins, up two flights of stairs, and you're on the boat deck. It is harder for first class to get to the lifeboats than it is for, for, for second class to do so. But the idea that, that you would purposefully lock them in there is just ridiculous. Now, there are locked gates on Titanic. That is, that is there. Uh, But it's not there because of this idea that you need to keep all the classes separate because, oh, my good Lord, an Edwardian lady would faint if she saw one of the peasants. That that whole thing of that. That whole thing in Cameron's film where you get Ruth DeWitt, um, Picata. That's it. Yeah, that's it. I do hope they're going to be seating the lifeboats according to class. That would be, oh, for fuck's sake, woman. Just... (laughs) Get a grip. I didn't even need her daughter to just give her the stern look at that point. It's like she she refers in the earlier on in the film that she refers to Molly Brown as being new money, which I would lead to suspect me then that DeWitt Bacater is old money. Which well, I've means, got no money after. Well, this is it. Oh, your father's debts. No, oh, fuck this. Like debt. He left us nothing but bad debts and behind a good name or whatever yeah. she says. Debts are just as powerful as assets as in Edwardian England. <laughs> really are. Nobody is going to write off your debts, okay? They're going to keep you going until you've paid them. But no, because now we live in an era of things like debt relief orders and bankruptcies and stuff like that, debt actually carries more stigma now than it did back in Edwardian England. So we need to make the audience understand that. But she's there and she's going to be old money, which means that she's various like landed aristocracy, that sort of thing. That is what old money in Edwardian England is. They usually have a whole load of, like, farms and other things that are going on around those estates. So Ruth dewitt Bacata is well, well versed in dealing with the working classes. And this is where I start to go, no, we stay away from modern politics on this show. This is where I get to good old-fashioned oh, no, 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 class no, we're, no, it's, no, we're, 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 no, when it's in a historical context, we're allowed. I said this when I did the president yeah. one. 
which is about Bush and blah, as long as it's historical, it's fine. But it's true because there's a there's literally a bit where Rose is basically trying to say, "Oh, ma'am, she doesn't say it as northern as this, but she basically says, mother, like I don't want to marry this little fella. He's 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 a he's a nutcase. I don't." And she's like. Would you would you rather see me as a seamstress? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, all our possessions scattered to the winds. And it's like, <laughs> really? What the yeah, fuck? Yeah. yeah, it's like, go out and get a job rather than pimp your 17-year-old daughter out to a 30-year-old abuser. Get get a job. Get a job and not <laughs> sail the high seas. It's like, come yeah. on. Borrow some more money. You know, why doesn't uh, she uh, marry somebody else? That's, you know, marry somebody who's well, yeah. about to die so you can inherit something, you know. There's, there's a hundred ways of doing it, but oh no, you've got to prostitute your own daughter out to this nut job. Who, I actually will argue, you know, Cal Hockley, not pleasant, but by no means the biggest pantomime villain in the film, in the slightest. No. Not even That remote. award goes to the, well, we'll get to Murdoch later. <laughs> Yeah, won't we? Who actually statistically saved more people on the Titanic than anybody else. And yet the way films have gone, the fi- I'm, I'm throwing one in now. The films yeah. have always held light all up as a hero. Fine. Yeah, no doubt. Everybody, I've, I've no doubt there was a lot of heroes on the ship. The crew the crew had the worst death rate of anybody, I think, off the top of my head. So, and I've read a lot. But Murdoch saved more people from that side because he didn't go with the whole light all because the orders were, you know, that, that scene, oh, God, I'm doing it again. That scene in every film or every TV series where Captain Smith goes, men, you've done your duty. Get the women and children off in the boat. Didn't happen. The guy's a breakdown, but I'm sure Paul will come on to Smith later on. But what gets me is there was no general announcement. There's no public address system. Tannoy, there's nothing like that. There's no radios. There's, they, they don't, there's some people, some crew members don't even know the ship's sinking. There's see lifeboats in the water. So it, it's like... The whole thing of me of where they're like, you know, men, you get the women and children at the boat. Light Aller is told a- anything that Smith decides were things that were suggested to him, which I think he does show in this film, to be fair. Where it's like, hadn't we better get the women off? Light Aller took it as women and children only, which meant m- most of the boats he sent down went down half empty. Yeah. And on the other side, Murdoch, which is we see with his mate, but we'll get to that, don't worry. We'll come around. There's a lot of circles in this. He saved more people because once all the women around him were in the boat, he was like, anybody else? Men? In? In? He, he, what, he wasn't... Because obviously the message was that garbled. Yeah. You know, there was no kind of, like, standing order. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he, he saved more. So the fact that they chose him... Because, I mean, I've heard... I can't remember who it was. I've, I've listened to reviews on Titanic before where people have said, why didn't they just pick someone named Officer or, you know... Yeah, we'll, we'll get to it. Anyway. Yeah. Sorry, Paul. I, I told it, you yeah, I'd go off on one at certain Yeah, points. you're right here. It would have been it would have been easy to to do that. There is the, when you start to get down to like fifth and sixth officers and things like that, you can name them, but nobody really knows much about them, the, and so forth. Very easy, very easy to have you know a n other quartermaster that is picked up and does that whole thing. It doesn't need to be Murdoch, and that's staying on Murdoch's reputation. You know, Mur- Mur- Murdoch basically died trying to save people from that ship. So the idea of just shooting yourself on the side after yeah. you've blown away a member of third class in mm. James Cameron's incredibly middle class, this is what I think of the poor, and this is what I think of people who are richer than me, just fucking allegory that goes all the way through this film. Is is just absolutely ridiculous, and I, I believe Mur- Murdoch's later generations actually took some legal action to him. And hats off to them for it. From I'm not sure about legal action off the top of my head. From what I remember, I think I think it might. Oh, I might be thinking this wrong, but from what I remember, I think I think I might be wrong. I think they were going to, and I think Cameron made a donation to like, is it the town of Dalbeatie? They made a donation to it. Uh, to the school, they, like, to, yeah, to the school, made a memorial, um, and kind of publicly apologised. But then, with the 2012 release and the more recently the 2012 or uh, the 2022 one, they don't take that out. Now, I agree, it's a film. You should be able to make what decisions you want. But after you know, to be fair to Cameron, though, I think in the he has admitted in like the last five or ten years that he feels like he really. He should have picked somebody who wasn't named. He, he does regret that. Yeah. Which, I mean, you know, I think it's fair. I think he probably realises, look, at the time, I, I didn't probably didn't 
he, I think he said something like, I, I was writing it like a screenwriter. I was writing it like I was writing a, a script to be exciting. I wasn't writing it uh, thinking of the people and thinking of the families that were left. I think that I think that was Titanic 20 years later, mm. the documentary, where he met families and he met descendants and he kind of said, I, I probably shouldn't have done that. Which, which you know, we, we all we all make mistakes. And I think at yeah. least he's kind of gone, look, that was, you know, good film, very exciting, but I think I might have, you know, one thing I'd, I'd rather, I wouldn't do again. Yeah, it's a, it's a thing that does annoy me with a whole variety of films where it's like, I'm not, I'm not one of these guys that expects a film in a historical setting to be a documentary. It isn't, you know, and I understood that I wasn't going into that cinema watching A Night to Remember. But when you start to mess around with actual real people, even if you're not going to do it accurately, at least show them some fricking respect, you know, and don't see it. They, there are films that can do this with a historical setting made with a true event that they've kind of exaggerated, slightly altered. And uh, Great Escape is an absolute classic example of this. OK, because you've got ev- everybody in there is all characters that are people that were never in The Great Escape. But what they're doing is amalgamations of things that did happen during the Stalag Love 3 breakout and its preparation. So you've got things like one of their forgers did go blind overnight on the basis of doing all that minute carving work by candlelight and stuff like that. You could take the Steve McQueen character out of it and things, but they changed all the names. So the only one that you can really, really link to its historical equivalent is Squadron Leader Bartlett, a.k.a. Squadron Leader Roger Bushell, uh, who's actually played relatively well. And yeah. from people who've known Bushell, there's, yeah, there's, you know, should be a little bit younger than, uh, than Attenborough, but pretty decent pretty decent representation of his character yeah. uh, and all the rest of it you can you, you can make up whatever hijinks that you want because you're not dissing on real people there yeah. or sometimes they go you know the other way valkyrie tom cruise all right klaus von stauffenberg is a fucking awful person he's not wanting to kill Hitler on the basis that, you know, Hitler's going to be doing all these awful things to the Jews. He was a proper full on supporter of that shit. No, he's gonna kill Hitler because Hitler's gonna lose the war. And this is this is totally changing. Totally changing. But yeah, I will you have to get me on to run about Valkyrie again, won't you? Whoa there, Paul. Give me yeah, give me time. <laughs> <laughs> so these but, but yeah, going back to this idea of the of being locked below, yeah, that are locked gates that separate third class and first class and second class and in fact there are locked gates that separate first class and second class but nobody gives a shit about them do they and broadly speaking (laughs) broadly speaking this is because first and second class you can be relatively assured that they've got medical certification to travel they can afford doctors they can afford stuff like that and then you've got third class which basically empties itself out of what they call emigrant villages and into, with a minor minor health inspection before they actually get on, and then you go from there. But what they're not, they're not paranoid about classes mixing. They're paranoid about third class spreading cholera just like it did in Hamburg. And the whole reason for that lock gates and the whole reason behind that separation, there's two reasons for it. Number one is to prevent single third class men mixing with single third class women. White Star actually advertised that shit to their third class female passengers by saying, you can come on the ship and you will be safe. Because we're going to keep those two separate groups apart. And secondly is, and this is where from about kind of 30 minutes in, I'm out at this point because you have you, you have Rosa Whitbicator has her 17 year old meltdown and decides rather than have this incredibly pretty diamond, beautifully lavish lifestyle and bit of a dick of a husband, I'm going to throw myself off the back of the Titanic, which is impossible for her to get to from first class. Absolutely impossible for to, her to do so. And the fact that she runs past Jack Dawson, who is sleeping on a bench, in what we may remind you is fucking freezing Arctic temperatures that people who are outside in are really going to be, uh, you know, really going to feel it. And But seriously, the moment that those two cross, the moment mm. that those two cross, 
American immigration law is going to quarantine that ship for six weeks the moment that it arrives at Ellis Island and everybody's going for it. Now, they then compound this further with that dinner scene. And I was thinking, <laughs> my first thought was, yeah, you drink, I mean, Molly Brown, you know, who probably is now quite comfortable with the idea of being quarantined in Ellis Island for six weeks, decides she's going to give him some clothes. And I'm thinking, so, OK, he's going to play that trope there that, oh, he'll pass himself off as one of them because he's in a white tie and tails and he's got his hand in the right place and he might know which fork to use and so forth. And they ruin that straight out, straight out. And they go, oh, yes, Mr. Dawson joins us today from third class. How is the accommodation in steerage? Now, it's worth... Oh, the best I've mind. seen, sir. Hardly any rats. You yes. Are, sir. It's worth bearing in mind, OK, who is sat around to that table at the time? And this is where I get into why the hell have you freaking done this? Because sitting around, and I watched it again last night to make sure I wasn't like I'd spotted everybody that's there. So you've Top got of the ridge. Oh yeah, here we go. <laughs> so sitting around there, okay, we've got Molly Brown and we've got the DeWitt Bacators and we've got Cal Hockley. That we know. There you can go. Also sitting around there is Archibald Gracie, first class passenger, Englishman, probably doesn't want to be quarantined for six weeks on Ellis Island. We've got the Countess of Rothus who is, you know, the moment she's got heard, oh, he's joining us from steerage. Like, really? Really? I've got some shit to do when I get to America. We've got Thomas Andrews, who actually designs the ship. It's going to be well, well worth, you know, he's going to be well knowledgeable of what the legal implications of this mixing are. We've got Ismay. Now, now Ismay himself is sat around that table and... Not just him, but White Star's pretty much commercial shipping license is going to rest on don't risk a freaking pandemic in America. You know, all it takes, all it takes is for somebody else who is sat around that table, like John Jacob Astor, an American businessman with a shit ton of political connections, to go, yeah, we we got held up in New York for six weeks, and uh, it's that guy's fault there because he quite happily entertained a steerage passenger coming into the first class lounge, and that's it. Then you, you're not docking in New York again with Britannic, with Titanic, with Olympic, Nomadic, anything else that you are ferrying people to America on is done. Yeah, I see what you're saying, Paul, but just to be devil's advocate, twat. Um, you, you, you know, you've got to make it count. It's all about making it count. I don't, I don't quite know what you're not getting, but make it count. It's what it's about. That scene. It's not about the reality of the situation. It's about, you know, I have, a, I have air in my lungs and a couple of blank sheets of paper. That's all I need. I don't need food and shelter and warmth. I just need a pencil and some paper. Just, yeah. <laughs> and that is how well rounded out those characters are. They are two blank sheets of fucking paper in depth. I honestly cannot stand either of them, as you well, can yeah. possibly tell. Yeah. I mean, you know, but Cameron is create better. He, he can create a better story than that. And you know, one of my like side rages is seriously anybody out there that thinks the Titanic disaster is just not dramatic enough that we need this pointless Romeo and Juliet exercise where we can say, ah. This is what bothered me about the 2012. I've done it already. This is what bothered me. <laughs> barely 20 minutes in. This is what bothered me about the bloody Julian Fellows one. It was an open goal for him. And it, 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 they made loads of stuff up, like locking up the Italians and all this random, like, you know, Charles Lightall are dancing with somebody in first class. And it's like, wh why have you put this in? It's like in Cameron's film when all of a sudden... Rose is quoting Freud's work that he doesn't do for under 10 years. Yeah, and, didn't publish like, that until she just, she just, Yeah, she just suddenly goes all like, starts smoking like Cruella de Vil, and she's just like, and by the way, the Countess of Rothers at that table, not only does she talk to Jack, not only does she look at him and sit near him, and she actually lets him kiss her hand uh, when he greets her, so there's an infection control, and you know, yeah. stay two metres apart, and shitting themselves at this point, it's yeah, it's, yeah, it's not good. Yeah, it? it's just Cameron is better at writing. You know, then this is the guy that gave, a, gave us Terminator, Terminator 2 and Aliens. We know he can do it. We know he can do a decent storyline. Yeah, there's some holes in there. But you don't have to do something that 
fucking glaring, especially when you've paid so much attention to what the bloody clock looks like on the grand staircase, that you then come with this vapid shite that, that's but presented the to is, me at that point. He He's not making the... F- oh, I don't mean this in the way it's modernly termed. He's not making the film for historians. He's making the film for, like... I was going to say teenage girls. He's essentially making the film for, like... You know the 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 young crowd, young adults probably get you know to to go there, see Leo and Kate on the ship. The theme that they're there for like that. I do agree though. There is definitely some disparities between why would you want to get like some things absolutely so spot on. It's like you're there, yeah. And then other times, you know, because I literally I've seen interviews. I've seen every behind the scenes you, you could imagine on this film. And, you know, Cameron make, takes pride, and they all do. Ken Marshall was involved. And, um, oh, God. Uh, Donald, uh, Donald, uh, Don Lynch, sorry. Um, uh, they're all, like, you know, visual historian. Uh, historian. They're, they're all absolutely, like, marvelling at how, what they did for real and how they did it. And mm. But then all of a sudden it's like, oh, yeah, by the way, we're, we're going to have people getting shot. We're going to have people getting, you know, chucked down here. We're going to have people getting punching stewards. We're going to have... It's like, did you need to, like you said, did you need to do this? But yeah. he's not, yeah, I mean, he's probably, he's not making it for the historian card, is he? You, it's this unnecessary thing of having to go, oh, well, it's love that crosses class boundaries. You can have a love story and a romance on the Titanic. I'm good with that. A Night to Remember does it really well. Really well, where there's just a couple that, over the course of that, they're slowly coming together, and then the ship sinks, and then they're looking out for each other, and it's all very tragic. You don't need to centre the entire film around these two pointless people when you've got all this... So, you know, it takes two hours, 48 minutes to sink. It's a perfect length for an epic drama on its own. You know, A Night to Remember does it. Does it absolutely brilliantly. You know, pretty much the only thing that it doesn't do is break the ship in half at the time. That's that's really it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'll give you a film. I don't know if you've ever seen it. um, 1960s film. Basically took the story of the Titanic in so many words, but then didn't say it was the Titanic. They just, they really lent into the fictional part of it that they could. Uh, Called The Last Voyage, if you've ever seen it. I've heard of it. I haven't seen it. Really, really good film. Difficult to get hold of. But, like, the boilers explode and blow this big hole up the decks of the ship and they've got to crawl across a plank, which all done for... Re- oh, it's, it's great. It's, yeah. like, just a brilliant, like, night. But that that did essentially... See, the thing is, though, it's like the hook and the bait. Like, if he did the same film on a random ship that sinks, whether it looked like Titanic or it didn't, would people have been in... Would it still have had the hook? I'd Probably not. I don't know, but... No, and there was the trouble, because you, you got the hook, and then, oh, God, that story was just so awful. Those people the, those people were just so awful. Everything he did about the actual sinking of the Titanic was, an, I take my hat off to him, I bow, okay? But it's all the other stuff that's in there that was just inlaid with all these kind of class prejudices that I'm going to hate people that are richer than me, and I'm going to patronise people that are poorer than me. And it's all there running throughout this entire film. I mean, you look at you look at the portrayal of steerage. No, well, I won't call them steerage because I'll call them third class. All the snobs call them steerage. You know, they're, 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 they're all plucky. They're all poor. They're all like a good fist fight. They, you know, and they're mostly Irish with one or two Norwegians and a couple of Eastern Europeans thrown in there. But it's that, oh, look, everybody loves the plucky Irish again. And, you know, he takes he takes her downstairs to the third class. I mean, it's impressive that she she gets onto that desk, throws her shoes to one lady in third class and ever sees those fucking shoes again. <laughs> because any one of those kids went, Jesus Christ, I've got 600 pound shoes. I'm off. And but no, you know, they're, they're, they're all the plucky Victorian Edwardian poor that have got their Baram party and she downs a fucking pint of Guinness part way through it. I mean, can you get any more tropey Irish? If I was Irish watching that, I would be absolutely offended. It's like, it's yeah, you get nearly what you think we are. The, the best bit after that is, is, um, is, is at the tropes is when she's, she's downing her said beer. 
And she like she hears a crash and she looks to the left and there's these guys that are just so pissed they've crashed a table and she looks at them and she she laughs like oh, I'm amongst my people and you're like this is a bit of a strange and this is before like like you talk about things that pull you out of a film. My auntie saw this in cinemas because I I love only I love only been a kid. Well, my auntie saw this in cinemas and she said the bit that totally just took her out of it. Was this this really dramatic scene? Steerage getting locked up. We know it's not real, but uh, third class stage, whatever you want to call them. I've been locked below decks. The rushing around trying to get out. You know, oh, the boats are going and all that kind of thing. That was meant to be Italian. It was dreadful, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> they're all, they're all. Uh, no offense, Italy. I've been. It's beautiful. You, you, you're like all oh, this is going on, and then in the middle of it, there's just this poor, presumably I, I don't Asian family stood with this little, like, translation book, trying to figure what out what, what the science is. And it's like, I, I don't know. It's like, what, what's what's that there for? I think it's a I get clumsy It's a clumsy thing. Languages. This is it. If you look at, if you look at, and that's right, the reason that I don't call them steerage is that people that travel in steerage can't afford to travel in third class and Titanic. Right, a third class ticket on Titanic costs about the same as a second class ticket on Mauritania. Okay, it is phenomenally expensive to travel on Titanic. You know, and Jack Dawson has to bloody win it in you know in, in some sort of rigged freaking poker game, and and yeah, everything, all the signs on Titanic are English. Now, if yeah. you look at if you look at third class passengers, two out of ten, two out of ten have English as their first or or, or main language. Okay, it's two out of ten. And all those corridors, one thing, Carrie, and this is why I praise him on set design, so all the signs are in English. All the corridors down there look the same. Mm. You know, they, and they did that, they, he did that quite well when she goes back down to yeah. kind of rescue Jack with the miracle axe blow. Well, there's, and, a, there's, a, there's accounts of crew getting lost hmm. on the film. Let's say, like, people would go off to craft services for food and be gone half an hour, and you'd be like, where have you been? I got lost trying to get out. So, like, they figured things out like that. Like th- th- like you said, there's some things in here that you take your hat off to them. They figured out new theories about the way the ship sank when they flooded the Grand Staircase. Because it, it, it was built the same, slightly bigger, because we're a bit bigger now. It ripped off its moorings and started to float up and panicked the hell out of them. Everyone was fine. And they think that's why the Grand Staircase, they think it ripped up and out. That's why there's no balustrades at the bottom. There's no wood wreckage. There's nothing. They think it just floated out and broke up or sank because it was quite heavy. There's, there's just no wreckage. There's nothing left of it. So, and also with um, the the Davids, the Welland Davids that were made that really, uh, that, you know, dropped the uh, lifeboats down, they were reinforced for the film, from what I understand. They were made by the same company, exactly the same way. They were slightly reinforced because, you know, modern health and mm. safety. And when they filled them up with passengers, and bearing in mind most of the shots in this, they're not filling them full. They said the Davids bent. They they like they literally like not bent the wrong word, that makes it sound like they broke. They're like visibly flexed as they were lowering people down and they yeah. were ringing fast. So the historians were like, Oh my god, maybe this is also the reason why people were so reluctant to get in. Not because, you know, we don't want to leave this because they looked at the Davids and thought, I'm not I'm not getting in that. That's gonna so yeah. the stuff, you know, all conjecture. But again, you know, it, they built some of it that faithfully that they they were able to say, well, look, we built this the same. We flooded it. Maybe maybe this is, you know, so it, there's things yeah. there to, you know, as you said, to kind it of pick was, up on. But. One of the, you know, one of the things that I really do take my is when they built, like, a lot of the deck sets as well. So because I saw an interview with, like, the set buildings, set design and crews and things like that. And they, they said they had them they had, they had them all mounted on hydraulics. So that in every scene, the floor that they are stood on is at the angle the ship was on at that time in the disaster. And now that, that is a spectacular level of accuracy yeah. to go for. Yeah. And yet you're, you're, you're going to throw me with this 17-year-old hormonal shite over here. Um, but again, what they've managed to kind of demonstrate with that is that, yeah, there isn't going to be a panic amongst the crew. There isn't going to be a panic amongst the passengers because... You get a tilt forward as the main kind of front fills up with all the watertight bulkheads. And then as the rest of it's filling up, the actual angle doesn't change that much. It just starts to go down 
up until that gets yeah. pulled, until you get to that final plunge. And within about five or ten minutes of walking on that surface, everybody who so who was on that kind of set said, for about five or ten minutes, you forget it's there. You don't you, you just don't think about it at all. So nobody's gonna get a particular pant, particularly given that Smith didn't order anything. You know, he's uh, like, he didn't, he, he, so the idea was like steerage still behind these locked gates. He's like, yeah, they're going to take the locks off because nobody has told them that it is that state of emergency that suggests yeah. that you break U.S. immigration law. Yeah, no, exactly. Because, the, you know, the, the another thing, you know, the ship doesn't launch lifeboats until an hour after it collides with the iceberg. An hour. Mm. Like, it's really slow. It's ponder. Well, calling it ponderous is polite. It's piss poor putting it in modern modern terms and you know you look at it and you know as you said a lot they reckon a lot of people thought the ship you know would take a bit of water on but we know we've so much gone on we'll take a bit of water on the ship will go down a little bit it'll settle because it was a long way down to, the, to that the water from that deck it was mm. you know, the top deck it was a long way down i'm not i'm one of these people who i'm not great with the technical aspect I, i'm more of kind of stories but um, you know, it's a good few feet down there, you know, so I wouldn't, people were thinking it's going to go down a little bit, it'll probably just settle, we'll, we'll, another ship will pull alongside, which had which had happened before, yeah. another, ship, another ship will pull alongside, and really had, you know, wireless being 24 hours, or, you know, lots of different, lots of ifs, buts, maybes, you know, that probably would have happened, it just so happened that, they, you know, because it's like not seeing another car on the road, it was, there were, Really unlucky, to be honest. But you know, disasters are a chain of events. It's never one thing that goes. And they they thought, you know, they thought, you know, someone up alongside will all get on. Because the the another thing that gets me. I'm sorry, I'm taking over, Anna. But <laughs> another thing that gets me about this is that people watch films now. Well, well, what watch films are watch about disasters with ships, and they think like we do in modern terms of lifeboats that they are to take everybody off that ship. And, you know, they were seen more as ferries at this time. They, were yeah. se- they weren't seen as something to take every single passenger off, put them on and have them survive. It was more a ferry system between the ships. Had it lasted longer, that's exactly what they would have been. You know, the mi- I don't know if you've got it in, but the myth that if there had been more lifeboats, people would have survived. They, they didn't get all 20. They had 20 lifeboats, 16 proper lifeboats and four collapsibles. They had 20 in total. They didn't even get those off. Two of them float mm. off. One light hauler, collapsible B, I think he ends up on top of. Collapsible A, you know, that just floats off. I think it's found with dead in it God, days, weeks later. You know, they, they didn't manage to get the ones off they had. So had they have had more there, they probably would have cluttered the deck. It would have made things worse. You have less crew working on certain things. You know, I think, you know, people don't pay attention to the lack of lifeboat drill on the Sunday, which you cancelled for... We've no idea why. You know, there's just more things like that. But anyway, sorry, Paul. Hmm. Uh, continue <laughs> on. I'll just, I'll just bang on well, it. It's one of them subjects for me. Actually, it's like talking about lifeboats there. It does bring me to like trope number two, which is the one that goes right on my tits, which is evil is me. And oh. just if anybody needs a character redemption, it's it's J. Bruce is me. Because like you, you see it happening in a night to remember, which I I love. You see it happening in Cameron's Titanic. In fact, he becomes a massive, just cartoon villain in there that that has a seventeen year old telling the chairman of the White Star Line about you know Freud and making little cock jokes and things like that that he is just too stuck up to get. And it's just Jesus, how many times do you want to just insult real people? Who's Freud? Is, is he a passenger? Sorry, yeah. that line's great. It's just, just what utter bollocks. And, uh, and the idea that, you know, Ismay is going to order Captain Smith to break the speed record and stuff. This is all absolute classic. And, and I started to break those sorts of things down and start to really think there about There is an them. account, isn't there? There is an account. There's one. Is it? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, uh, go on, I'll let you. There's, there's, there's one account of Ismay wanting the ship to go faster. And the ones, what he's wanting the ship to go faster is he's wanting to beat the top speed of Olympic. He's, he, the, we have this idea that is, oh, well, look, if we, get into, if we get into New York a day early, fuck that. 
right? If you get into New York a day early, right, you've got what what we're talking about. There's about about I think it's about something like about four hundred, six hundred first class passengers or something Some like, like that. that. Yeah, yeah, like four hundred, six hundred. I mean, they've got things like transport arrangements, how hotels. If you yeah. rock up a day early. Right, irrespective of the fact that you're going to be six weeks late because you're quarantined in Ellis Island because of that 17-year-old fucking drama queen, but you turn up in a day early, you are going to piss off the bulk of... You're you're looking at 40% of your income for that journey is not going to travel with White Star again because you completely fucked their travel plans. You are a travel provider and you messed with their travel plans. This is if you are portraying these people who are going to have a massive shit fit with you, if you use the wrong fork with the fish course, you start giving them an extra hotel bill to turn up with. They are going to get really cheesed off. It's just, yeah. No. You know, and the um, idea as well that and um, uh, the idea as well that it would somehow that Ismay could just somehow order Captain Smith. To do that is just plainly ridiculous. You know, I'm not a fan of Captain Smith. Like you say, he's, I think, I do rate him as a very, very competent sailor commander. He knows how, he knows how to steer a ship. It's not him that's on the deck at the time that it strikes and things like that. He knows what he's doing. He, the thing is, he's got this absolutely flawless record up to the age of 860. He's never really been in a disaster before. And when he's in a disaster, he fucking falls apart. And to be perfectly honest, I don't entirely blame him. You know, I have no idea what I would do in that. But, the, the you know, the businessman and the giant moustache of Bruce Ismay goes, come on, EJ, let's get the second, for, third and fourth boilers lit and really hammer home. You just go, do you know what? I'm going into an ice field. I'm not going in at full speed and shut up. Well, see, again, can you get the conjecture? Because the idea at the time was that from what I understand, and I haven't read everything, I haven't seen everything, was that you'd get through an ice field as quickly as you can. The, the, the plain point of the matter is Titanic didn't know they were going towards an ice field. It was a freak year for the ice. Mm. It had never been this far south. Smith actually stands on the bridge, I think the day before, uh, on the Saturday, I think, or might even be the Friday, um, after they leave, you know, Cherbourg, sorry, Queenstown, sorry, Queenstown, um, and he decides to take them further south he literally stands there with a watch and goes, right, turn now. He goes further south than even they usually would. He takes the southerly route and then he goes even further south. The idea was you would get out of it straight away. You yeah. can get into the stuff about tele- you know, telegrams that didn't get passed on, you know, messages from the Mississauga. You know, before you get into all that, it, it's very much the idea at the time was, well, get through it as quickly as you can. Yeah. And I'm out for that. But, you know, the idea, the idea that Ismay is going to make that decision and that Smith well, is yeah. going to go along with it is, uh, is absolute bollocks. But the two, yeah. the two major recurrent themes that come up with Ismay in this particular, just part of the character assassination that we're discussing is that he could order around Captain Smith, which he can't, and that he wants to get the blue ribbon that crops up in more than one uh, of these films, which I'll come to in a moment. And and it's we're going to make the headlines by taking the blue ribbon. Right. The blue ribbon is held by Mauritania in 1909. Titanic cannot touch the speed of Mauritania at all. At all. She is at top full out. She is about 24 knots. At full out, Mauritania is 28. We know this because that's what they have freaking sea trials for. That's, that's why they test these things. This is a matter of yeah. public record. We know what the top speed of Titanic can do because they sail it out, do it, and then come back. Yeah, they find I think that in the l- look at Belfast, I think, because mm. they test the lifeboats as well. Because the ship essentially had to get signed off. So like a test drive for anybody, you know, who's yeah. not as into it as we are. But, no, I mean, I'm sure you'll get to it. But, you know, there's, before we get to the actual historical stuff of Izmir, um, there's... There was a chance in here for Ismay to have a redemption because the scenes that were filmed that are on the deleted scenes of certain for Cameron's film, where Ismay is like essentially led through like the widows. And yeah, it's a, it's a bit theatrical, but you see how this man's just destroyed. He can't look anyone in the mm. face. And I, I, I personally think that we're trying to make a point of that he fell apart 
then you could argue that, you know, you've survived and my husband hasn't, blah, blah, blah. Um, but the fact is that, you know, to, to segue into the historical, this is historically accurate in terms of, I'm not, I don't know whether he's led across the deck on the carpet. I doubt he was. I, I bet he would have been shivvied away quite quickly because he ends up with the doctor of the carpet. Yeah, apologies. It's been a while. Mm-hmm. I can't remember the guy's name. But he ends up, I think, rostering. Obviously, the captain's like, right, go. And they get sent to the, the, the doctor. And the doctor gives him, I, I mean, gives him opium, uh, which, you know, Sherlock Holmes is on. I know it's fictional, but a lot of people know that. And um, he's basically sedated, as we would know it, for the next however long it takes them to get back to New York. And, you know, there's lots of things stacked against him. He's got some, you know, some beef with this newspaper magnet. Think, think a yeah. kind of, you know, th- you know, someone who the newspaper. There you go. Spot on. This is why right. you get. This is why you get someone who knows the stuff. <laughs> I know this. So yeah, so he um he gets nicknamed Jay Brute Isme because it was Joseph Bruce and anyway. So he gets nicknamed Jay Brute Isme, uh, basically because this guy's got beef with him and he, you know he's an easy scapegoat. You know Smith. This is the thing with Smith versus Isme. Smith yeah. falls to bits, but because he does the quote honourable thing. And you know he goes down with his ship, you know to the very end. We don't we don't know what happens to him because we don't we don't know. Obviously we never recovered. That ha- you know because that that's the end. It's it's looked upon totally differently yeah. than it is someone who survives and then the newspapers get involved and you know we think of kind of and again I'm not going to get into the politics of it and start arguing about it, but you know this whole trial by media this is not a modern phenomenon like it's not something that was invented in the 90s this has been going on for a long time so there's a lot stacked up against them really and you know I watched a couple of documentaries and historians that said you know he he would have just been another another name on on this role and maybe he thought. Maybe he was just terrified. Maybe he just he panicked. You know, if you want to call it cowardly, but we've got to fight our flight. And as much as we'd all love to think we would all stand and fight, or we'd all stand and you know face mm. our face our fate in the Britishest way possible, sometimes people just run. You know, you've, you look at the Blitz for how people act when they're under extreme fear. I know that's a bit out there, but um, Forgotten Voices is, is great for that. But yeah, it's you know it, there's a lot stacked up against him. And, you know, the guy, in all accounts, you know, he, he dies young. I mean, even for the time, you know, of complications of diabetes. And and I think yeah. the way that it went, it was, you know, maybe he just panicked. Who You could admit, you know, he just jumped on or, like he said, maybe he got on board because there was nobody else. And he thought, well, what? Well, the, I, the I, thing I, is, there's going there's to be things that need to be done. We, Who knows? We know what Lifeboat Lou is made was on. Okay, we know it's, it's, it's collapsible boat sea. It's one of the ones that floats off, doesn't even really get launched. It's not capsized or anything like that. It's upright. Okay, but it's one of the final boats to leave. So this idea that part way through he talks around and panics and get, gets in the lifeboat. I mean, there's the, there's one. I, th- I think it might be. I think, I think it might be the. Oh, is God. it the 1953 one? Is it no. 1953? no, I think it's one where he disguises himself as a woman. Um, no, I don't might, think it is. Oh, is might it be the uh, might be the one that's got Catherine Zeta Jones in it, where George C. Scott plays. Oh, yes. I haven't seen that one. You know, the SOS Titanic. I think uh, it's a little bit after that one. I think it's just oh. called Titanic. Oh, it, yeah, it was uh, that yeah, awful. Sorry, I yeah, refused yeah. to go near it again. Yeah, yeah, um, but. But yeah, I mean, he's actually you know cited by Archibald Gracie as right up until the end, he's helping people into lifeboats, he's, he's arranging things, he's checking around for further survivors. He literally gets into that lifeboat, according to testimony, because there's nobody else around and there's space mm. in that lifeboat. Everybody else is at the other end of the ship. And there you go. Get in, get out. Because like, somebody's got to answer for this. And it does. But the sheer character assassination of Ismay just totally drives me insane. Because, again... It is, as Cameron had said in, in an interview when he was talking about the opportunity to, you know, redeem Bruce Ismay, and he was, the public demand of villainous Ismay, and boy did they, boy did he create one. It's the second worst portrayal of Isla, Ismay in a story for me. The first being very deliberately done, which was 
what we lovingly call the Nazi Titanic, which I know you were going to have a watch of, weren't you? I've got some notes. I've yeah, so for those of you out there that are not aware, it's like 1943, Goebbels commissions a film about the Titanic to A, show the superiority of German filmmaking, which it completely fails to do, and to B, show up all the evils of capitalism in England, um, which it does laughably. And But that actually paints out Ismay to be deliberately... Tri- but for those of you that are not of an investment background, it will already bore you to tits, because part of, most of this film is about <laughs> trying to short-sell White Star Live oh. stock... And so- John Jacob Astor tried to short sell it even more to bankrupt his mate, and somewhere in the middle of that, a ship sinks. And yeah, it, oh, it, yeah, it's <laughs> it, it, it's not good. I I'm gonna because you know I've watched it. Admittedly, it's the first ever film, and this is genuinely true. I'm not joking. In two and a bit years of doing review it yourself, where I have watched a film on two speed because I can't. <laughs> I'm like, I've got to watch it. And this has got subtitles, so I was having to speed read. But I thought, I can't watch this for an hour and a half. I'll do 45 minutes. And I sped read it, because obviously it's in German. Um, yeah, so anyone who doesn't know, it's known as Nazi Titanic. It was just called Titanic. Yeah. It and was the first film think... to just use Titanic in the name. Oh, there you go. That's what's good. Yeah. Um, so it, it was, I think, probably the second film that the Germans had done after uh, In Night and Ice, on Nacht und Ice, which I did a review on. Go find that one. Uh, which now is the oldest uh, surviving Titanic film. It would have been the one with Dorothy Gibson in, if I remember rightly. Yeah. Uh, but I think that yeah. got lost in a fire in the 20s, I believe. Uh, off the top of my head, again, I read a lot. Don't go exactly off the date. No, you're um, right on that one. And Dorothy Gibson, of course, played a ridiculously overly flattering oh, version of herself. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. Um, where she's, like, walking around smoking, playing cards with the men. Herbert Selpin, um, and again, if you want to look at it or miss you, look at the death of him. But let's not get into that. Yeah. The old, old Herbert Selpin, Selpin affair, because I don't know what went on there. Um, the German version, it was screened once in 1942. And, yeah, I mean, so in the 30s, this Torbis film kunst, be careful like you say that, uh, limited, the Berlin company had the thought of bringing the story of Titanic back to cinemas. Why not? It ends up in kind of production hell, um, f- and especially given the landscape of German politics, putting it mildly, changed dramatically over the next three years. Uh, Adolf Hitler obviously becomes Chancellor of Germany in 1933. Then in 1942, which is, strangely, it's not something you, you associate with that year, it's the 30th anniversary of the sinking. So it seemed an opportunity to develop a film which would highlight the um, the kind of unwanted in kind of German Reich society and also add some... Good old anti-British, well, it's anti-English propaganda, um, you know, as the Second World War rages on. Because at this point, it's fairly, you know, it's fairly drawing, really. Um, not to kind of diminish it. Um, filming begins in 1942. And, yeah, it's just... It's awful. It, it's, yeah, it's not good. I mean, it's, you know, on the... <laughs> On the an interesting day, point there. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, you'll like, you'll like this, right? I'm boring myself. It's rated. <laughs> it's rated six point one on IMDb. Well, yeah. Okay. I, I, this is why That's, I don't go off those. That, that ranks it as being better than Friday the Thirteenth, Charlie's Angels, and Final Destination Three. I've said, I've said no, not having it. <laughs> not having it. Um. Roller coaster. Of love. <laughs> Destination Three is great. I love that. That's such an underrated, you know, film in that series. Um, yeah, I love that series. Yeah, on the thirtieth of April, to bring it wildly back to uh, the <laughs> National Socialists, on the thirtieth of April, nineteen forty-three, it's termed "quote of great political value to the National Socialist State." Uh, I took a lot of this um, from a book called Titanic, nineteen forty-three. Uh, by a guy called Malt Feebing, so go go check that out. Um, 5th of December 1944, it is then pre- prohibited by the orders of the Minister of... And I, I all, everyone thinks Minister of Propaganda. Uh, his real title is quite interesting. Nefarious, but interesting. Um, so, Joseph, uh, Joseph Goebbels is known as the Minister for Popular Enlightenment and Propaganda. So you can't get... I mean, it's 1984, but not before 1984. Yeah. Um, and because at this point, the Germans, uh, it's clear they're going to lose. 
uh, which we touched upon earlier uh, when Paul was on about um, Valkyrie. But clearly they lo- they're going to lose at this point. It's just a matter of when. And they basically saw, I reckon they were thinking, yeah, we probably don't want this. Um, because they talk about being the safest ship, the fastest ship in the world by English experts. English and expect it, and I was like, yeah, okay. Like, well, no. it's like, even uh, during that it, film, both Ismay and Smith, and every officer on the Titanic that isn't the token German they put yeah. in at first officer, yeah. officer refers Peterson. to the ship as unsinkable. Nobody, until no. it sank, yeah. referred to it as unsinkable. And you go back to Cameron's movie, okay, when Ruth DeWitt Bacata turns up, first, her first line in the film is, so this is the ship they say is unsinkable. If she's saying that, she's saying some very, God very himself. niche yeah, yeah. engineering yeah. magazines, because that's the only time it's ever mentioned. Yeah. In which they called it practically unsinkable. Then, yes. then the unsinkable, <laughs> then the practical bit got lost, um, as they are, as as it does. So, uh, yeah, oh, uh, yeah, it, it is unsinkable. God himself could not sink the ship. Wrong. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> ba dum <Ba-dum-bum>. bum <laughs> Um, the engineers, uh, of course, the engineers, the workers, the German Workers' Party, uh, it all fits in. They're the sceptical ones, and, of course, the talking German, Peterson. Uh, he notices, and, and, and there's, there's, uh, you know me, if you listen to this podcast, I tend to go through the plot. No, there's just nothing worse going through here. Like, this isn't even one of those where it's like, oh, you know, don't tell people what they should and shouldn't watch. Don't waste your time on this. Yeah, no, seriously, don't I waste agree your time. Yeah. Like, if your mum says to you, do us a favour, love, come and cut my toenails, I've just got out of the bath, that's a better use of your time than this is. And if that doesn't yeah. tell you, like, that's such an odd example. And uh, Even no, if I've you spend an hour and a half cutting your mother's toenails, it's still a better use of an hour and yeah. a half than watching this. Exactly. Like, it's absolutely... Also, you'll get more brownie points doing that than you will out of watching this. I, I don't know any situation this will do you any good. I mean, you know, it was and, easy and enough to, to get pulled out of this film. You talk about the, the moment the, like, your aunt gets pulled out of the film. So, like, so when, you see, when you're seeing they're having the concert in third class, and there's a freaking stripper. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Why? Like, like, why? Yeah, why? Like, We're going to go with the yeah. immorality of these people now, are we? Because they're English. Well, and it's I like, think, what? Yeah, I, just, I, just, I was just like, oh, what's this? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean... <laughs> You know, Officer Peterson has this really awful scene where he stood there going, if we hit, if this happens, this will be dreadful and everyone could drown. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? It's like really bad. He stands and makes this big scene to the the captain of the ship of which and the managing director of the line he works for. This is like marching into like your boss's 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 boss and going, this is a disaster. You're probably not going to be there very long, let's be honest. Um, yeah, I mean, Officer Peterson, of course, you know, notices the damage, goes and saves a little girl at the end, swims her to a boat. Um, but I wrote down, you know, the inevitable um, needless destruction of the ship with thousands of men, women and children at the, at, at, at the hands with, with a nutter at the helm. Must have seemed a little too close to home. By 1943, 1945. So they thought, yeah, we're not, you know, we're not going to lose. And then they try and make out about Ismay, and he has been caught at the inquiry. And they're like, well, we we find you, you know, we find you not guilty, you know, released, cleared of all charges. And like, Peterson sat there like, no, it's like Macaulay Culkin esque, like, no, this is not right. You know, and all <laughs> the engineers are there like, no, you know, people have died. And it's like, it's, it's, I mean, obviously, it's, you know, it, it's in such bad taste. Mm. But, you know, because I thought, because I'd never seen it before, but I thought it was going to be all about a certain group of people and how they're evil and all this. It, 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 that's not there at all. Re, not that I could see. It's all about capitalism and, and all this kind of thing. Well, this is the interesting thing with this film, because, like, I mean, they don't hide it. You know, the, the, oh, no. the final caption of the film... Der Tod von 1500 Menschen bleib ungesunkt eine ewige Anklage gegen Englands Gewinnsucht. Which for those of you that do um, do speak German out there, I am sorry I just murdered your language. Uh, but for those of you that don't mean speak out German out there, it's the deaths of 1500 people remain unatoned, an eternal con- condemnation of England's endless quest for profit. I mean, it's a, right there. Now, curiously, once the Second World War's over, who's putting this film out? 
the Soviet Union. They just Soviet Union re-edit it, get rid of the German, get rid of the German opening credits, redub it so that it doesn't refer to anything German, re-screen it for its anti-capitalist credentials. Well, this is the thing because Hitler hated communism, it, you know, but national socialism. The clue is in the name. The, the, Two the cheeks of the same socialist. arse, I always say. Yes, there you yes. go. Two eggs and a hanky, if you want to be a little yeah. bit more polite. But literally, like, you know, this is, you know, this, it's socialism in action, it's not a surprise. People just tend to say fascist and it gets lost. Dig a little deeper, you know, if you've got a strong stomach. Um, yeah, it, it, it's just, it's, it's not worth your time. It, it's just shit. It really yeah. is. It's just shit. It's not like, you know, even if it, even if it was made in Weimar, Germany, or you know, post-war Germany, it's it's just not it's, it's not worth it, your time. It's still even shit. for someone like me, even for like me, I love my, oh you Paul, I love my history. I love reading about the Second World War, First World War. I love all that. I don't love it, but I, I enjoy reading about it. I find it interesting. Uh, Titanic is a bit of a mastermind specialist subject. I'm like, this is right in my wheelhouse, no pun intended. And then you watch it and you go, this is just not worth your time. And that's me. So as a layperson, just just don't just. Honestly, don't waste your time on it. Like, really don't. Like, it's not like a, oh, how bad is it? Just don't. Do something else. Yeah. Make a cake. Make corned <laughs> beef hash. Do something else. Do something the, else. Uh, the, the, the great irony of Nazi Titanic is, again, not only did it get used to actually promote communism uh, in the end, but they filmed it aboard the Cap Arcona as well, that sometime later sank with a much more catastrophic loss of life than Titanic did as well. Yeah. Horrendous. How prophetic. Well, I feel an oh. awful lot calmer for that, but I will just go just round off. I did say like the the, the biggest the, the biggest villain of Cameron's Titanic movie for me, Rose DeWitt Bacata. She just ruins everything that she fricking touches, and it's like the the, the high points for me is the sudden teenage mood swings. When she she's going, oh well, you're, you're you're just poor. You can't possibly talk to me like that. You dare talk to Lady Go. Oh look, you've drawn this one-legged prostitute in her hands. Like, just just what the fuck? But it's it's when it's going down, and you've got you know she's she's going down to do the massive axe lucky strike on uh, on Joe. Well, I, I I imagine he was wishing that that she'd just cave him in the head so he could get rid of this stuck-up psychopath. Because, like, he tries to put her on a lifeboat. She gets off. He tries to put her on another lifeboat. She jumps back on the boat. It's like, I am being stalked by this 17-year-old psycho. I think I'll just die. That's bad out of context. Do you know what? Do you know what I was... Do you know what I was... I, I listened. I've got to shout them out. I was listening to... Um, I listened to a couple of Titanic... Uh, reviews recently. I listened to um, Seismic Cinema. They did one. Mm -hmm. Really, really good. Really interesting to listen to two people who really aren't into the history just to talk about the film. Really good one. And I also listened to um, Paul and Sophie over at SP Film Viewers. Paul also did my wonderful logos for the podcast. Um, he, they watched it, and Sophie wasn't a big fan of it, um, the man and wife. And he, she had a rant, you'll love it, I recommend you listen to that one, you'll really enjoy it. And she made a point that I've never realised realised before, I don't know how it's passed me by, if she stays on that boat, they both live, because Jack gets on the, oh, could he have fit on it? No, 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 if she hadn't, if she hadn't got off that boat, he, even if Carl hadn't have stood by his lifeboat thing, which he probably wouldn't have done, he would have been able to get on that big wooden door, like anyway, like I mean, that's you know, that's. I mean, I, I, I am a big it buy into me, that. Frankly. There is room for both of them on that door. He just sees a way of getting rid of this psychopath once and for all. It's like I know the only way I'm getting out of this is to tell her I love her, wait until she goes a little bit tired, and then just freaking freeze to death because that's my only escape. This is a woman who bad who body checked a second-class steward into a lift and ordered her to take him down into a flooded room. Like, the fuck no! <laughs> You've missed the bit where she punches the steward in the face. It's just... I mean, by that stage of the film, everybody's punching stewards. We're, 
But yeah, it's a bit much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like when they're battering down the door and one of them turns around because you know I can't help but think that ever since making Aliens, Cameron just doesn't like the British. The Trevor Guards White Star property. You'll have to pep go fuck off. I mean, he hasn't quite gone full Mel Gibson. He hasn't no, gone like no, the but Patriot. I... But but Mel makes a damn good film. So you know, I mean, yeah. you know, for, for, for his other I, faults, I will give him that. <laughs> but he makes a good film. You know, but, uh, yeah. But yeah, it's like don't waste your time watching Nazi Titanic. Don't waste your time Not watching sure. Cameron's Titanic. Watch a night to remember. It is the best of the lot in story and in accuracy and everything. And I stand by Kenneth Moore to this day. For, you know, the night to remember is, because it was made when there were still survivors, I know there was a couple, but there were kids or babies, but, it, you know, it was made, I think Lawrence Beasley was one of the technical mm. advisors and tried to jump back on board as it sank, but they had to say, no, you can't, because it would have brought union rules and shut them down. And you just think, it was it was made, and yeah, it's not as historically accurate as, Cam- well, Cameron's sinking isn't perfect, we, we well, they don't know exactly, but yeah, from, from the night to remember is probably the probably the best one. Yeah, e- to be honest, easily and accuracy. and by far. I mean, me and my friend came out of the cinema because I am old enough to have gone and seen it in the cinema. We came out of that and just went Kenneth Moore every time. You know, it looked spectacular, but they ruined it. You know, if you want to go see the Rose and Jack story, go read Romeo and Juliet because that's basically what it is. Yeah, so is her character totally irredeemable to you, or do you think they could have tweaked it to kind of to to, to make her come out across to you a little bit better? Because um, I mean, I th- had they actually kind of... brought the two classes a bit more together, I think it would have made a much better thing. But the trouble was, is you've got a you've got a view that is held by relatively affluent people that work in the arts as to what aristocratic people are like who they've broadly never met or had any dealings with and what working class people are like who they've broadly never met or had any dealings with. So you've got these two absolute caricatures of stereotypes trying to develop these, these two people trying to create a relationship where the people who are writing this have got no idea what either of these two people are like. And when you're yeah. starting from, like you say, two blank pieces of paper and that's it, you've got these romantic stereotypes that are just based around bullshit. You try and combine that, you're going yeah. to increase and multiply the level of bullshit. Yeah. Well, we, you know, we get the 90s trope of on the back seat as well, which everyone seems to bypass. And it's like, yeah. that's... It, it, but, I yeah, mean, good luck having sex with a girl in the back of that car. Right, there is barely enough room to sit two people in the back of that car. <laughs> well, they reckon Cameron nearly found it. Well, they reckon he he thinks he found it, but that it was inconclusive. They couldn't quite. It, it just some people said it was a heap of rust. He said he saw a fender or the bonnet, whatever you want to call it. So yeah, it's, I, I, I do think though, you know, for whatever the the film has its faults, you know, the fact that he essentially makes the film because he wants to dive on the Titanic. <laughs> and then he uses all his money from the film um, and probably a bit from Avatar later on, but I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole, um, <laughs> to basically go you know, in the Challenger Deep to the bottom of the ocean, becomes a very well-respected, um, yeah. you know, ocean ex- deep sea explorer, um, an engineer, and, you know... It's he loves the ship. You can see that he deeply, oh, yeah. deeply yeah. loves the ship to the point of going down and actually visiting it and, like you say, financing all that stuff. Okay, love the ship. The same love isn't extended to the disaster and the same love isn't extended to the 2,200 people that were on board the ship when it struck that iceberg and the 1,500 of them that didn't survive it. That, that same respect is not there. And I would like to see that. Do you think he wasn't old enough? Do you think he should have waited? Because I think if he made it a bit later on, he might have kind of, he might have made it a little bit differently. He might I have, don't know. Because I think it, it it reminds me of what Spielberg said about ET when he made, when he remastered ET in was it two thousand two yeah. for like the twentieth anniversary and like he replaced he replaced the guns that the cops carry with radios when they're about to, you know, the cycling and the take off, because he thought, why do they ever have cops like threatening kids with guns? 
Um, it's it's like kind of odd, and he hadn't had kids when he made it. So, do you think maybe a bit of a random example? But do you think maybe Cameron, in a way, kind of he probably should have thought a bit more about. I know. About, I think if you look at like if you yeah. look at Cameron's projection, you know, pre- projection into stardom at that time. You know, you take you take where he started out. Okay, Piranha Two, the spawning. I know. Flying I haven't seen that. I'm not to watch that. There, then you get there, then you get Terminator. You know, absolute genre creating classic. You go further up the ladder there by doing Terminator Two. Yeah. You um, messing around with the abyss and stuff like that. So at the time that you've come off the top of that roller coaster, true lies, true lies as well. Yeah. You know, at that point, you, it's you, it's Cameron's golden age. Pretty much off the back of doing Aliens, then Terminator Two. The absolute golden age of Cameron. He could do what the fuck he wants, and the trouble is he does. And that's what he yeah. wants. That's what he wants to do. Now, whether or not he's looked back in hindsight and gone, I probably shouldn't have done it like that. Hats off to him if he's made that admission. But it's like where Christopher Nolan went. Okay, so like Christopher Nolan does Memento, absolutely brilliant. Okay, then does Dark Knight and these his Batman trilogy, which are again, you know, apart from I was a little bit shaky on the third one, but they're brilliant. He does Inception, which is classic. And he can do whatever the fuck you like, Christopher Nolan, because you're brilliant. And then he comes out with Interstellar and Dunkirk and Tenet, like we couldn't get mind fucked up enough. And it's like, guys, don't do what you want. Do what we want. This is going to work for you. Yeah, well, that's that's Hollywood in a nutshell right now, anyway. But it's um, oh, and you dipped into Pollux there. Did you spot it? Did you yeah, spot it, yeah. everyone? Um, no, I think um, I think, and I think he's probably admitted since. I think he he obviously he goes with the fictional. Whether he decides to do that because it's easier and you know you can have the you know, you can get the audience you want and your characters you want. Maybe I think he probably. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, I'm trying to think of the right word, I had it, but it's buggered off. I think he definitely, he probably falls prey to, like Nolan, which I call the Christopher Nolan effect, uh, different to the M. Night Shyamalan effect that I made up, but the Christopher Nolan effect is basically, as you've just said, Christopher Nolan did these films and everybody was like, right, do what you want. Inception, I still think, I've seen Memento, I think it's good, but I still think Inception's his best ever film, better than The Dark Knight, better than you know, Batman Begins better than The Dark Knight Rises, which I don't mind. I've, I would I wholeheartedly that agree. Um, Interstellar, which I watched again recently for only the second time, massively underrated. I think, I think because it came out after Inception, it was looked upon nowhere near as fondly. I think it had that a little bit like The Dark Knight Rises. It comes out after something that's so good that everyone kind of goes, "Oh, this is a bit disappointing." I don't put Terminator Two and Terminator Three in the same bracket. Um, but you, you know, <laughs> Do you know, sorry, then, sorry to interrupt you there, but I've always been one of these people on, that, like, post Terminator Two, the Terminator franchise just doesn't exist. It stopped existing. I won't recognise it. And the best ever thing that I found in a charity shop was a DVD box set, and I've still got it. It's entitled Terminator: The Complete Collection. It's got one and two in it, and that's it. Well, like, there you I've go. got to buy that. <sighs> I'm a bit of a soft spot for salvation. I know. I I, I just I don't know what it is. It, I think it because it tried to do something different. Yeah. Um. I think Bale was miscast, but never mind. That's another story for another day. I think. Um. Yeah. I think he fall a bit like Nolan. He gets like do what you want. He does Interstellar. I think it's it's good. The music's outstanding. I think it's a good film. You know, good bordering a great, but not a confirmed great. You know, you move to um, Dunkirk. Is it after that? Which I think I enjoy it, but I don't rank it as highly as yeah. you know a to- atonement, or I don't rank it as highly as nineteen seventeen. I don't. The, one of the best films I've I've seen in recent years was the German uh, remake of, um, well, adaptation of the book, uh, All Quiet and the West. Yeah. Front, that that blue that. Not I loved that. A million percent historically accurate, but that was I thought that's one of the best war films I've seen ever. You, you know. Um, Really unbelievable, but I think Christopher Nolan he he needs someone to rein him in, you know. In uh, Tenet, which I saw, dear God, it, I I just you need you need to have someone you need you need somebody to root for, and that was just the fact that Interstellar's his best sorry Inception's his best film, and Leonardo DiCaprio to link it with Titanic spent like I don't know if it was a year, but spent months with Nolan working out Cobb's backstory and 
and I I give a lot of credit to DiCaprio because I think he wove in a lot of the emotion. I mean, I'm like, this is all just assuming. But mm. I think that's why that's the strongest one of his films for the actual emotion behind it rather than just all this spectacle. The spectacle's great, but Cameron, he, he, he said he was going to do um, a film based on um, a survivor, a Japanese survivor. Uh, he wants to do uh, Yamaguchi, the guy's called, and he wrote a book called The Last Train from Hiroshima. And he survived both the Hiroshima and the Nagasaki nuclear bombs. And Cameron's been talking about making it for years because he promised the guy not long before he died he would make it. And he's spending all his time making these Avatar films. And it's like, can you? Because I watched Avatar 2 and thought he clearly loves sinking things again. And it's like, oh, Cameron, like, you've got such skill. Like, please spend it. Because you can't go on forever. You're getting on. Please don't spend your last few years making these films about blue people that are really enjoyable in the cinema. And you, it's escapism and you forget your life for a couple of hours, which is what cinema's for. But there's no lasting impact, personally, for me from those films. It's not like a Titanic. It's not like any of the other films he's done. And I think, please make this nuclear film before. Because he's such a good director. And there's so few of them at the minute. There's so few and you should directors. ride off the back of Oppenheimer. Wait, you know, while that roller coaster's See, on there, take that market on. I, this is going to be, well, no, it's not, because it's just my opinion. I thought in uh, Oppenheimer it was filled full of unbelievable performances. It looked beautiful, but I don't think it's a good film. And I, I don't mean it, it's a so bad film. I've... I don't I don't think it's a bad film. Because I, I, I know some people think, well, if you say it's not good, it means it's bad. No, it doesn't. It just means... I was disappointed in it again. I'm waiting for his upswing. Because for me, I mean, I know people won awards and, you know, Downey Jr. was brilliant. Killian Murphy was brilliant. You got everybody who was anybody who was in that film. But as a film, it's not something I'm going to r- rush and rewatch. I won't buy the DVD. Yes, I'm old fashioned. I just, I just won't. I have no interest. They put it back in cinemas. I don't want to go see it. They put um, Tenet back in cinemas. No interest. They put Inception back in cinemas for its 10 year yeah. anniversary. You better believe I went to go see it. Put Sim Proud Ryan, and I went to see that. I saw Braveheart the other week. I don't always need to talk about it. It was great, but I'm rambling. Next so. year, 50th anniversary of Jaws. I am totally in the cinema well, for that. There you go. Oh, absolutely. Oh, God, yeah, that'd be good. And, oh, no, no I'm mixing up my years. But, yeah, no, it's, um, do you have any further points? Or is the rage, is the rage I have got, I, I have got it all out of my system now. I, I really have, and I, I'd like to, I thank you for giving me an opportunity to rage because running history rage, I'm always listening to the rages of other people and it is good to get some of that pent up blood pressure out. I hadn't, yeah, I uh, listened to your episode with, I can't remember the lady's name, but she was brilliant from a couple of years ago about protect and survive. Loved yeah. that. Absolutely loved that. And, uh, and cause obviously it's more like an interview. It's not an interview podcast, but it's very along the lines of they're there to have their say, um, rather than my guest who struggled to get word in because uh, <laughs> of me. No, um, it was, it was, uh, I, I really enjoyed it. And obviously you, you and your co-host uh, did, kind of, I thought, oh, and then when, when you launched in, I thought, oh, because you never know quite what you're going to get with the guest. And I thought, oh, we'll launch in. We'll and then it was just like bang. And I thought, oh, they, this, yeah, that was a lot of pent up rage there. I, um, <laughs> it's good to get it out. It's good to get it out. Yeah. Um, yeah, you want to give want to give a listen to the. We've done a few sort of like film linked episodes because, like our third ever episode, we had Dean Strachan on from the Chronicler Chinese History Podcast, who odd, oddly enough ranted about Braveheart. Now it's not remotely connected to Scottish history. Uh, then we had the guys from Fighting on Film on. Um, if you've ever run across them, they did uh, they they did a lot of ranting about Nolan and Dunkirk. Ooh. And then um, they they might be up for a get. And then we had uh, Zach White on, which come he comes pr- quite a lot to do anything sort of Napoleonic Wars. Um, a big plug out there to the Napoleonic Wars podcast. But basically, he went to see the new Napoleon movie and literally mm-hmm. DM'd me from outside the cinema saying, "I have got to rage about this shit. It was <laughs> fucking awful." And, and I recorded him like two nights later before he'd calmed down. He was uh, do, do give that one a listen. To be fair, yeah, I, I understand the rage. If anybody, um, the probably the best example of that outside of the Defender episode where we, where my guest Arthur, bless him, from uh, Two Cents Critic made me watch a film with Hugh Jackman called um, Reminiscence, which is 
done one of the worst films I've ever seen in my life. Until you so, saw Nazi Titanic. No, well, actually, no, my, my example, well, kind of, well, it wasn't offensive, it was just dreadful. The, um, boring, and just like, oh, here we go. The Which is the cardinal sin, bored, boring. You just can't bother watching it. The one film I was going to say, um, which I absolutely despised, and like your like your friend, I did the review. I got out of the cinema at 10 o'clock at night, and I did the review. It was back when I did solo reviews. I did the review at 2 o'clock in the morning, knackered, angry. It was the latest James Bond, No Time to Die. I hated it. Absol- still do. Absolutely hate it. With a passion. It's awful. It's, it's, it's not a Bond film. I, I absolutely despised it, and it crushed my soul um <laughs> and the batman the batman which i got dragged to see twice six hours of my life I'm never gonna get back and it's the most overrated piece of uh batter rang you've ever heard in your life oh just so i'm, I'm partial to it but no it's, it's so for anyone um who's in, unfamiliar would you like to explain i think it's pretty self-explanatory but just in case anyone you know just to make sure explain what history age is and where you can fa- where you can uh, find it and all, all that jazz yeah the bit so... that everyone loves the plug <laughs> so the, yeah the history rage is we're weekly episodes one a monday what we do is we invite historians museum curators other podcasters people of a history background and we always ask them the same rage question which is what is the one historical thing you wish everyone would just stop believing so we've had people come on to say like oh yeah the, the nazis are not this technological powerhouse the battle of britain wasn't a close run thing battle of trafalgar not really that important you know Waterloo, not all it's cracked up to be. Um, we've got a few future ones coming up. Um, uh, I've just been contacted by somebody who wants to do... There were ships on D-Day as well, you know. Uh, Spitfire, not all that. We've had that in the past. That was... <laughs> and all of these things. It's all basically, you know, everything that you... Everything that you get told from popular culture about history... Is it right? Our first ever episode was a particular pet rage of mine, which is the Birkin hair are not body snatchers, and yet they're the most famous body snatchers that we've got without actually ever having dug up a grave. So we've got about 102 episodes out in public release at the moment. We've been going for about two years. You can find us wherever you found this and at uh, historyrage.com. Nice. Yeah. Get yourself up and have a listen. It's something I've been watching for for you know been following for quite a while and now i've like gone through picked out a couple of episodes this new because i'm one of these people if i don't know much about it i think right i'll save it for when i've either watched something or i've read something to go back and check out but it is well worth it because there's nothing better than having a good whinge or a good rage you know my, my one and i don't know if anyone's done it would be kind of you know the th- keep calm and carry on it didn't exist it was never released you know, it, anyway, but I don't want to, let, to get myself that one. It just annoys me. Because everyone's got it on tea towels, like, and it's like, that's not... But we didn't sit... Not we. The British yeah. didn't sit back and go, oh, well, we'll win be, this and we'll have a nice cup of tea. Oh. You will be pleased to know there is an episode upcoming on Blitz Spirit. Oh, good. I look forward to that one. Cracking. Really, really good. Because, um, obviously, I, did, I wrote my dissertation about memory, all about how, what we remember. And why we remember it, um, which was fascinating. Why did why did we use examples of you know fighting Nazi Germany when we were in the middle of a pandemic? What what purpose did that serve? Again, uh, the politics, my politics <laughs> rule. Uh, but no, thanks to Paul for coming on. I've, I've absolutely loved the chat. I hope you've enjoyed the the catharsis. And um, yeah, it's been great. Um, you're listening to uh, Review it Yourself, the podcast with the sigh. No politics, no pandering, absolutely no point. Yeah, again, you can find us wherever you want. We've gone to uh, episodes twice a month, so every two weeks, funny enough, on a Monday, uh, because I wanted to kind of, um, it's just me, so I wanted to get the quality up a little bit and cut down upon the release schedule, but I, I think it's paying off, and there's lots of stuff coming out. So yeah, go back and check it out. If you like the Titanic stuff, there's loads of stuff to go back to. We did a night to remember. I did an episode for the Titanic series. Um, I've done Titanic untold stories. Uh, we've done a couple of documentaries in there. Uh, there's there's all sorts. Um, so yeah, go back and check that out. But again, thanks for listening. Cheers to Paul for coming on. And yeah, thanks a lot.